Judges chapter 8. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 21 tonight. I titled the message, They Are Those Types. <laughs> I was telling the guys in the back, I said, I can't wait till we start our college ministry because we're going to have some fun with the titles. They are those types. We're going to be looking at three types of people tonight. And even as we come to chapter 8, we have been looking for some time here at the life of the, life of the judges of Israel over the past few weeks, couple weeks, months. And for the last few weeks, we've been focusing our attention on a specific individual by the name of Gideon, who, had, who has gone literally at this point from zero to hero. And as you may remember, Gideon was a fearful young man. And when the Lord selected him to lead the nation of Israel into battle against the enemies of the Midianites, while Gideon was reluctant, he was afraid, he was in a sense a coward, he was hiding, but he was reluctant to obey the Lord's call. He lacked faith. He tested God multiple times. And eventually he did as the Lord commanded. And we saw last week as Gideon led the 300 men, Gideon's mighty men, right? 300 men into battle against an overwhelming army of 135. And God intervened and gave victory to Gideon and his men. Uh, it was an awesome, ast astounding victory. One supernaturally, God intervened because God won. Because God deserves the glory, right? God likes to be worshipped. God likes to be glorified. And He wants to make sure that as He, as he works through our life, that He is worthy of our praise. And so, only 15,000 men were left of the original 135 men that began the battle, Judges Chapter uh, 8, verse 10, we're going to see that this chapter records the events that occurred in the, in the immediate aftermath of the conflict. And apparently, not everyone in Israel, that they were excited. Not everyone was excited about the great victory that God had given Gideon and his men. Have you discovered that? Great things happen in your life. There are some people that are just not excited for you. God's doing work in your life. You're changing your life. You, you were, when you were in the dump, when you were in the gutter, they were your friends. They were your homies. As long as you were drinking with them, as long as you were doing drugs with them, as long as you are out clubbing with them, it was all good. But the minute you start doing better for yourself, the minute you start achieving victory in Christ, the minute you start wanting to be sober, you want to stay pure, all of a sudden, that's why we titled this message, They Are Those Times. <laughs> you think people would be happy for Gideon but yet there were some that were not happy why? because they were more concerned about their own personal profits guess what? you stop doing drugs and that drug dealer ain't happy no more right? you stop drinking and things start changing it's amazing how when you stop those things they become free don't they? hey uh, by the way no I'll get it for free don't worry about it it's all me it's because they want because they want to keep you down. Same thing with alcohol. But here we see for, for Gideon, there were there were those who weren't happy because they were out for their own personal profit, and also they were dealing with their own pride. And then they weren't about what God had done for their nation. They had failed to grasp the big picture. They were to focus on their own interests, their own selfishness, their own best friends. Three best friends, me, myself, and I. And even as we look at this passage, it allows us a glimpse at both sides of human character. And on one, on one side, on one hand, what do we have? We can see the pride of those who care for nothing more but personal pride and personal glory. And yet on the other hand, we see those who are motivated by the glory of God. We see some who cared for nothing but themselves, and we will see some who persistent in the face of opposition, circumstances, and overwhelming odds. And tonight, again, we're going to look at those types of people. You guys are saying, what types of people? We're going to be looking at, number one, prideful people. We're going to be looking, we're going to be looking at those who, uh, who are political and those who are persistent. Because they are those types. 
As we consider these three different types of people, even tonight, let us also consider ourselves. Let us examine our lives. And as we do that, may we find ourselves on the right side of the issue. On the right side, on the right team. So let's look here at those prideful types of people. In verse 1, it says, Now the men of Ephraim said to him, why have you done this to us by not calling us when, when you went to fight with the Midianites? And they reprimanded him sharply. And so he said to them, what have I done now in comparison with you? Is not the gleaning of the grapes of Ephraim, of Ephraim better than the vintage of Abizar? God has delivered into your hands the princes of Median, Oreb, and Zeb. And what was I able to do in comparison with you? Then their anger toward him subsided when he said that. So we see here the prideful type. The criticism of Ephraim, the people of Ephraim, sorry. And we are reminded when in Judges chapter 7, verses 24 and 25, paraphrasing as the Midianites and were de uh, defeated and were on the run, Gideon sent messengers to the men of uh, Ephraim to pursue after them. And the Midianites did this and they killed two of the princes of the Midianites and they brought their heads to Gideon. And when they went up with Gideon, they began to criticize him. Now, we see here, as they begin to criticize him, what is the problem? Why are they criticizing Gideon? Why are they so upset? Because of what Gideon just done. As we know, he just, he just won a great big battle with 300 people. Well, this is the problem that they had. See, they, they want to know, basically, we see here, they wanted to know why they weren't asked to join the battle. They wanted to know why they weren't asked to join the battle. That was the problem. And it says here, as we look at verse 1 of chapter 8, it says that, and these are strong words, that they reprimanded him sharply. And the word reprimanded has the idea of bitter, strong, or cutting words. So in other words, they attacked Gideon because he had not called them to the battle. And so let's look at the tribe of Ephraim. It was the largest tribe of all tribes at this time. And the tabernacle was located in Shiloh, which was in Ephraim, Ephraim. And the Ephraimites decided, or descended from Joseph and his Egyptian wife. They were a tribe that was proud. They were, they were proud of their heritage. They were proud of the influence, of their, of their influence. They were also proud of its power. And they wanted respect. They wanted the respect of the rest of the tribes. And the reality was Ephraim was often on the wrong side of spiritual matters. And how do we know? Because we see here even later during the reign of the judges and Jephthah in the tribe of Ephraim was again complaining that they were not asked or invited to the battle. And we see that in Judges chapter 12 verses 1 and 2. And I'll read it to you. Again, later on down the road, we'll run into him again. And it says, The men of Ephraim were called, the men of Ephraim were called to arms, and they crossed to uh, Zaphon and said to uh, Jethanah, Why did you cross over to fight against the Ammonites, and you did not call us to go with you? We will burn your house over, your, over, over you with fire. And, and Jephthah said to them, I and my people had a great dispute with the Ammonites. And when I called you, you did not save me from their hands. And when I saw that you would not save me, I took my life in my hands and crossed over against the Ammonites. And the Lord gave them into our hands, into my hands. Why then have you come to me this day to fight against me? Then Jephthah gathered all the men of Gilead and fought with Ephraim. And the men of Gilead struck 
Ephraim because they said, you are fugitives of Ephraim, you Gilites in the midst of Ephraim and Manasseh. So what happened? <laughs> they got socked in the mouth. Right? That's what happened. I mean, we see that later during the reign of Jephthah, the tribe of Ephraim would again complain that they had been left out of the battle. And in that, we see we got to be careful, don't we? We got to be careful who we mess with because you just might get your butt kicked, right? But I want to read you a verse here out of Proverbs 16, verse 8. The Bible says it's better, better is a, better is a little with righteousness than vast uh, revenues without justice. So what do you mean? Well, what I'm saying here is that this, uh, these people didn't choose their battles wisely. In Hosanna 7, 8, God says that Ephraim is a cake not turned. What do you mean by that? That is, they were overcooked on the bottom and raw on the top. They were hot toward the world and cold toward God. Ephraim was a tribe marked by trouble, pride, and selfishness. Another powerful rebuke to the pride of Ephraim is focused or found in Psalm 78 verse 9 when the Bible says that the children of Ephraim being armed and carrying bows, they turned their back in the day of battle. So we see their personality, their characteristics. And the reality is they are jealous of Gideon's victory. That is what it comes down to. They were jealous of Gideon's victory. And they are sorry that they missed out on the spoil of war. They are angry because they were not the object of glory. Because their name wasn't on the shirt or the banner. They were angry. And so what did they do? They turned on Gideon. And if, and if Ephraim had been truly concerned about the oppression of the Midianites, they could have, have gone to war by themselves. Or they could have volunteered for Gideon's army, but that never would have worked. When Gideon asked for the fearful to leave the battle, or for those who bowed to drink to leave, their pride would have kept them from submitting to the will of the Lord. Because they are those types. In this case, all they were concerned was with their own wealth. Again, they wanted to get the spoil. They wanted to get the glory. And in that, they missed out on all. The, the uh, Ephraimites are typical of those who are full of self. That's what we see here. An example of those types of people. They strut around calling attention to themselves. But when trouble comes, they are the first to run. They're the first to turn their backs. They won't do anything, but they are quick to lift their voices. You should have did this. You should have did that. I call that squawking. They do a lot of this. This is what you're doing. This is what you need to do. Right? They do a lot of squawking, they do a lot of criticizing. But they won't make a decision. They won't take a risk. Or join in with others as, as they seek to follow the will of God. But they do not hesitate to find fault with the actions of those who are attempting to do something for God. To do right for God. To live a righteous life. They are, there, there are plenty of people still around who think and act just like the Midianites. But that is an attitude the church can do without. Amen? Let's go ahead and look at verse 2. So he said to them, What have I done now in comparison with you? And I like the way Gideon diffuses the situation. We can learn something from this. He says, is it not the gleaning of the, the grapes of e, uh, Ephraim better than the vintage of Abizar? God has delivered into your hands the princes of Median, Oreb, and Zeb. And what was I able to do in comparison with you? Then the anger toward him subsided when he said that. And we can learn a lot from this. What do we see Gideon display here? 
as he's dealing with this situation, because we deal with this every day, believe it or not, at work, out in the public, in our houses, we deal with it every day. And I like what Gideon shows. Gideon shows self-control. That's what he shows, self-control. And we see in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 to 23, the Bible says, again, that self-control is what? A fruit of the Spirit of God. It's a very important, vital vitamin of our spiritual walks. And the Bible says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, last but not least, self-control. Against such there is no law. Gideon displayed a great example of self-control. Instead of reacting in anger to their uh, criticism, Gideon responded graciously. He responded graciously. Again in verse 2, Gideon reminds them that the Lord had blessed them. You see how he turned the table? That the Lord had blessed them. That they already possessed more than those around them. In other words, he says uh, that the leftovers from your harvest is greater than what we get in our harvest. So, bro, you're already being blessed. Amen. And Gideon then reminds them that God gave them the, the Midianite princess. And he turns away their wrath. You see how it says that their anger, what? Subsided. You see, we need to get better at that, don't we? We need to get better at that. Instead of adding fuel to the fire, what do we need to do? How do you put, how do you put a fire on? You remove the fuel. Right? I remember when I was a forest fire fighter back after high school, and we would, we would, they would drop us off in the mountains with, with rakes and shovels, and, and they would say, go put out a fire. I'm like, really? I'm a city boy. Where's the water hose at? You want me to what? So we're out there with picks, and you know, we're, and we're, we're moving the brush. We're removing the fuel. And you're creating a what is called a fire line, and you have to get to the dirt. So fire can burn dirt. So you got to remove the fuel in the same, and that's what we, see, we saw Gideon do here. He removed the fuel from the fire. You see, he turns again away the wrath because he swallowed his pride. You see how that works? He swallowed his pride and thought about what was best for, for the nation. Gideon was not motivated by his own feelings. He was motivated by the submission to the will of God and to sense the, the sensitiveness of the Holy Spirit. Self-control. He could have easily started a war with them, literally started killing people. As we're going to see that he ends up doing eventually to a particular group of people. But here we see he displays self-control. Gideon gave them the glory they wanted. And they were satisfied. You see that? Their anger subsided. And I want to encourage you, when you are doing something for the Lord, you can't expect to be criticized. You can't expect to be criticized by those who are doing nothing. See, we already do something, church. But there's a lot of do-nothing churches. Or people. And when they attack you, your motives, your, your motives and your efforts, it is easy to get sidetracked and allow anger to rule in your heart. And it's easy to lash out and tell them off, right? Or put them in their place and you can leave justified. But the reality is, is God glorified? When the attacks come, which they will come, can I warn you, they will come all shapes and sizes. We should do like Gideon and exercise what? Self-control. Can we say self-control? Self-control. Over our emotions. You see, because our emotions shouldn't dictate or lead our decisions, what should lead us? The Spirit, right? And the Spirit, the first thing it tells us is what? Love. Joy, peace, kindness, right? Long-suffering, self-control. And I like this verse in Proverbs 15, verse 1. You may want to write this down. It's something that I would say it's even a lot. It'd be a great life verse to carry around with you. Try it. 
Go out and try it. Let me know how it works this week. Here it is. You ready? Proverbs 15, 1. It says, A soft answer turns away wrath. But a harsh word, what does it do? If, you can, if we can get this, right? If we, can, if we can exercise this in our life, do you know how much blessed your life will be? A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. And you know what I'm talking about. I'm sure you have many examples. <laughs> right? You work, you work the long day at work, right? You come in home, you sat in the freeway for hours. You're, you're excited to be home. You're coming in, you know, with flowers behind your back. And, you know, your wife's been home with the kids. The kids are not having a good day. And she opens the door and there it is. <laughs> right? Instead of you saying, babe, how was your day? The first thing you say, what? I'm hungry. And then all of a sudden, she retaliates with, and? <laughs> Make yourself something to eat. Whatever. But if you were to come home and say, babe, can I make you dinner tonight? Or how was your day? How can I help you? Is there anything that I can do for you? More likely, you're going to diffuse a lot of those, those things that she's ready to just release upon you. <laughs> Proverbs 16.32. And I love the Proverbs. Why? It's a book of wisdom. <laughs> we can learn something. I love this. Again, another memory verse, a life verse that we can apply to our life. As we see Gideon displayed this, it says, he who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. Wow, did you get that? Man, if you can control your anger, it says, he, who's who, he who is slow to anger is better than the mighty. Why? It's easy to pull your sword off, out and start sniping people, right? But keeping that thing away and allowing the spirit to to have that self-control and to allow the Lord to work through your life and rethink your reaction, your response. Go to the bathroom, let it out. Come back smiling. Pray before you get in. I, what I like to do, a little secret for you men, call before you get home. <laughs> call when you're about 10 minutes away. 15 minute, give 15 minute cool down process period. And just say, how are you doing? How's everything? And Based off the words after that, kind of give you an idea of what you need to do when you get home. <laughs> Oftentimes, I mean, my wife's not even at home, but I'll call her as she's coming home from work. How you doing, sweetheart? How was your day? Oh, I was very stressful. It was long. Customers, customers that, oh, sweetheart, um, is there anything I can do for you? Get ready. We got to go to church. All right. Let's go. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But in get, and we see here, instead of getting sidetracked by our, our critics, right, we must keep our eyes on the task that we have been assigned to by God. And he tells us in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, and how, how do we do that? Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. It says, looking on to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And Ephesians 6.6 6 tells us, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. And when all the battles are over, and we we look at the eyes of Jesus on that judgment seat of Christ, right? We will, not give, an, we will, we will uh, not give an account to those who challenge us. We will give an account to the Lord, you see, because 
Much is given, much is required. It is vital that we do his work, regardless of what the proud, prideful, cruel critics try to bring against you, because they will. And it may even come from your own house, because they are those prideful types. Let's look at the political type. We see here, as we go back to Gideon, or to Judges, chapter 8, verse 4, it says, When Gideon came to Jordan, he and 300 men who were with him crossed over, exhausted, but still in pursuit. Then he said to the men of Succoth, Please give loaves of bread to the people who follow me, for they are exhausted, and I am pursuing Zeba and Zamuna, king of Midian, and the leaders of Succoth said, Are the hand of, of Zeba and Zamula now in your hand? That we should give you bread, that we should give bread to your army? So Gideon said, For this cause, when the Lord has delivered Zeba and Zamula into, the, into my hands, then I will tear your flesh with the thorns of the wilderness and with briars. Then he went up from there to uh, Panal and spoke to them in the same way. And the men of Panal answered him as the men of Succoth had answered. So he also spoke to the men of Panal, saying, When I come back in peace, I will tear down this tower. We see Gideon's simple request in verse 4 and 5. And what was that? Just some bread. As Gideon, his, his men, they continue to pursue. In pursuit of the Midianites, Gideon be, becomes concerned about the welfare of his men. They pass uh, to towns, and first they come to Succoth, and then they came to Panal. And each of these towns, Gideon made just a simple, a very reasonable request to his fellow Israelites. He asked them for bread to feed his exhausted, weary men. This was a request that should have been granted without hesitation. But we see a shameful refusal in verse 6 and 8. Instead of coming to the aid of Gideon's, uh, of, uh, of God's chosen deliverer, Gideon, the elders of both towns, they refused to get involved in Gideon's fight. These men are playing politics with the things of God. In other words, they are saying, if you don't have their king, you haven't really won the battle. If we help you and you are defeated, then those kings will come after us and we will pay a terrible price for our decisions to come alongside you to help you. No, you are not getting any bread from us. But these cities are part of the tribe of God. The name of Gad means a troop. Specifically, the name refers to a troop that crushes through the enemy. And the fact is, the reality is, is that these people were not living up to their name or their heritage. They would not even help the men of God. Chose to deliver them from their enemies in his fight for deliverance. They, I would say, are like the politicians of our day who have to see which way the wind will turn or the wind is blowing before they will make a decision. Why? Because they are afraid to take a stand. They are afraid to take a stand for God. When the people of Succoth and Panal refused to support God's work, they were clearly demonstrating the fact that they were against the work of God. That they were turning their backs on the Lord. When they refused to help Gideon and his army, they were actually guilty of giving aid to the enemy. These people were not thankful for what God had already done. And like the, the Ephraimites, they only wanted to find fault with Gideon and to protect their own necks, their own little kingdoms, they failed to realize that by giving bread, giving Gideon's men bread, they would be guaranteeing future what? Blessings 
future blessings for their people. All they cared about was maintaining the status quo. And you want to know something? There are still those types of people. There are people around who do the same things these cities did. There are churches around that do the same thing that this city did. You see, they are, there are no gray areas when it comes to the work of the Lord. No gray areas. You cannot be neutral when it comes to serving Him. Jesus puts it this way in Matthew chapter 12, verse 30. The Bible says, Matthew 12, verse 30. He who is not with me is what? Yes. Is against me. There is no middle ground. You're either for me or you're against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. See, we have too many people playing the hokey pokey. We got one foot in and one foot out, right? And we turn ourselves around. Those who refuse to support God's work will not support those who do serve Him. And those who do not respect the work of God will not respect the workers of God. When we refuse to give to the work of the Lord, when we refuse to participate in the work of the Lord, when we refuse to respect those who work for the Lord, just because we are looking out for our own interest, first, guess what? We are guilty of aiding the enemy in his work. So what happens? A serious response. You see the difference between the first situation and this one? When it comes to God, when it comes to God's people, the seriousness of Gideon protecting the sheep, the flock. You want to see a different hat on Pastor Dan mess with God's sheep. I don't care what you do to me. You spit on me for all you want. But when it comes to God's children, when it comes to God's people, when it comes to your families, so help you God if you come against the work of the Lord. Amen. And we see this in Gideon's life as well. Serious response in verse 7 and 9, right? He was very serious in that. He says, I will tear your flesh with thorns of the wilderness and with briars. Verse 9, he says, again, when I come back in peace, I will what? Tear down this tower. Because these two cities refuse to do what? They refuse to help. They refuse to aid God's people. Gideon tells him that they will face judgment when he returns the, the victor over the Midianites. And he reminds him that there is a price to pay for standing against the Lord and His work. There's a price to pay. And we would do well to remember that truth today because one day, brothers and sisters, we will all stand before the Lord and give an account for our services to Him. If the Lord is speaking to your hearts and the Lord is calling you out and the Lord is asking you to do certain things for Him, I would encourage you to respond the voice of the Lord. I went into A.B. Miller this week. I was, telling, I was telling the kids, if you're here today and you've, and you've questioned God and you've asked yourself or you told yourself or you've talked to God and you said, God, if you're real, show me. I said, well, by the fact that I'm here speaking to you, you know there's a God. Because I would not come here if God did not tell me to come here. So, you, so I'm here to do the work of the Lord. I'm here as an oracle of God for you. Because God loves you. And God wants, wants to speak to your heart. God wants to save you from yourself. See, one day we're going to stand before the Lord. And give an account for doing His work. Even when we fail. Then for opposing those who are acting, trying to serve the Lord. Romans 14, 2.
The Bible says, so, so then each of us shall what? Give an account of himself to God. You see that? So then each of us shall give an account of himself to God. Every single one of us. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. The Bible says, Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch over your souls. As those who must give an account, let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for all. You see that? God saved us and our life no longer belongs to ourselves, does it? James chapter 2 verse 18 Actually, I'm going to read verse 14. It says, But what is a prophet, my brother, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him if a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food? And one of you say to them, Depart in peace, be warm and filled. But you do not give them the things which are needed for the body. What does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, it is what? Dead. Dead. But someone will say, you have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith. How? By my works. See, God has saved us. We've been redeemed. But now we have a responsibility, what? And go out and serve the Lord. Lord, even as Paul, right? What do you want me to do for you? God has placed us in his work. We see in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. What does it say? We are what? We are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for what? For good works which God prepared beforehand that then we should then what? Walk in them. So what am I doing? I'm, we're just merely walking in those good works that God has prepared beforehand. See, God expects us to be involved to the best of our ability. Get up and get active in the work of the Lord and never ever be found hindering or opposing or standing in the way of what God is doing in the world. That's the wrong place that you want to be. Be very careful when you get in the way of the work of the Lord. May we never, like these people, be guilty of refusing to serve the Lord out of fear. You see, because they are those types of people. Prideful types, political types. Now let's look at our third type, and that is a persistent type. We see here, going back to, to Judges chapter 8, in verse 4, when Gideon came to the Jordan, he and 300 men who were with him crossed over, and what were they? Exhausted. They were exhausted, but still in pursuit. As you go down here to verse 10, again it says, Now Zeba and Zamula were at Kakar, and their armies were with them, about 15,000. And so they were still outnumbered, Gideon, and all who were left of all the army of the people of the east, for 120,000 men who drew the sword had fallen. Then Gideon went up by the road of those who dwell in the tents army, uh, of the army, while the camp felt secure, when Zeba and Zamula fled, he pursued them, and he took the two kings of Midian, Zeba and Zamula, and routed the whole army. Then Gideon, the son of Joash, returned from the battle, from, oh, sorry, from the uh, a, a, oh, sorry, accent of hers, and he caught a young man of the men of Succoth, and interrogated him, interrogated him, and he wrote down, for him, the leaders of Succoth and its elders, 77 men. Then he came to the men of Succoth and he said, Here are Zeba, Zeba and Zamula, about whom you ridiculed me, saying, 
Are the hands of Zeba and Zemula now in your hands that we should give bread to, to your weary men? And he took thee out of the city and the, thro the thrones of the wilderness, the thorns of the wilderness and the briars, and with them he taught the men of Succoth. And he tore down the tower of Panah, and he killed the men of the city. And he said to Zeba and Zemula, What kind of men were they that you killed in Tabar? So they answered, as you are. So were they. Each one resembled the son of a king. Then he said, they were my brothers, the sons of my mothers. As the Lord lives, if you had let them live, I would not kill you. And he said to Je uh, uh, Jether, his firstborn, rise and kill them. But the youth would not draw his sword, for he was afraid because he was still a youth. So Zeba and Zemula said, Rise yourself and kill us. For as a man is, so is his strength. So Gideon arose and he killed Zeba and Zemula and he took the crescent ornament that were on their camel's necks. Wow. So what do we see here? We see persistence, don't we? We see that persistent type. While some people walked in their prize and others allowed personal politics and their agendas to determine their uh, allegiance. Gideon and his men simply were persistent. They were persistent in the work for the Lord. And in their persistence, what did they do? They set a good example for those of who desire to be found, what? Faithful in serving the Lord in the Lord's work. So how did they continue? Well, instead of being discouraged, and defeated by the criticism that they received in verse 1 through verse 4, right? The, by Ephraim, what did they do? Well, they continued to persevere. And I love this because in verse 4, it tells us, it says that they were what? They were exhausted. You see that word exhausted? Can you say exhausted? exhausted. They were exhausted. They were exhausted. <laughs> Yet, they what? They pursued them. They were pursuing them. These men, they were tired. They were weary. Where were they tired and weary from? From the battle. They were, they were hungry. They, are, uh, they, need place, they need a rest. Yet, they need to carry on. Right? They need to carry on. And what did they do? They carried on. You see, that's, that's part of what we were talking about yesterday, right? I can do what? All things through Christ who gives me strength. Right? Don't you feel exhausted sometimes? I mean, there's times, by the time we get to bed at night, it's like, I don't even remember closing my eyes. I just wake up. <laughs> it's like, I sit down, it's like... <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, right? And there's times where you're exhausted, but you got to what? Carry on. You have to carry on. And I love that type of attitude. And that's the type of attitude that we need to have. And I love that, you see, because where did we ever get this idea that there was a place to sit down on the Lord? Where did we ever get this idea that we ever take a play out for God? Where did it come from? I can't find anywhere in the Bible. Where did, where did we ever get this idea that it's okay to sit back while others do all the work. That's an entitlement mentality. That's not good. That's not good for the Christian. Where did we ever get the idea that we could, could back off, that we could slow down, that we could take it easy in our spiritual walks? Where do, where do the wolves, where the, the Bible says that the, uh, that the, the the enemy walks around like a roaring lion, seeking to be made devour. You know who he devours? Those that are straggling in the back. Those that slow down in their walks. Those that take a play off. Hold on, I need to take a break. You guys are going without me. I'll miss church here. I'll miss church there. I'll come back at Christmas. I'll come back in Easter. If you come back. Where do some people get the idea that they can join a church and never do anything? Wherever those ideas come from, they are certainly, they certainly did not come from the Lord. 
And I would encourage you that it is an idea planted in our minds by the enemy to try to get us to quit, to quit on the Lord. And I would recommend that we be like Gideon and like his men. And I would even encourage you, suggest that even when we get tired, we get weary, what do we do? We press on. We press forth of the glory of God. We see a great example of this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verse 58. The Bible says, Therefore, my beloved brother, be what? Be steadfast. Be immovable in doing what? <laughs> Always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. We all grow weary, don't we? We all grow weary from time to time in the battle. When we do, we need to look to Jesus for, for His example. And we see in Hebrews chapter 12, Verse 1 to 3, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. What do you mean by great cloud of witnesses? People are watching you. They're watching your life. You may not know this, but they could be your neighbors. They could be your coworkers. They're watching you. And they know when you take a playoff. It's like watching a, a football game, being in the stadium. You know when somebody missed their block. You know when somebody didn't want to make the tackle. I've seen it many times. DBs and the running back comes out the backfield and they're afraid because the DB, the fullback is a lot bigger. They kind of fall, make it look like they try to tackle the guy. <laughs> Just totally quit on their team. Totally quit on their team. And that frustrates me. Man, if there's one thing that really is a pet peeve of mine, man, that is quitters. That's cowards. Therefore, since we're so surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, then he says, look, look at this, let us throw off what? Everything that hinders, and this is the NIV version, or every weight, right? And sin that so easily entangles us and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on who? Jesus, the author and, well, it says here, this verse it says, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith for the joy set before him. What did he do? He endured the cross, scorning the shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, considered himself who in, uh, endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not what, grow weary and lose heart. And that's one thing I want to encourage you with tonight. Jesus never asked us to do anything that he wasn't willing to do or that he did. He doesn't ask us to do anything that he didn't do. And he doesn't leave us orphaned and he does give us the power. He gives us everything we need and he tells us in his word that he will never give us anything that we can handle. We will only be in the world a short time. A short time. The Bible says life's about a vapor. And then we will again fly off, where? Into the glory of God to be with Him forever and ever and ever. That's, we're only here for a short period of time. I mean, today may be your last day on this earth. Do we have any regrets? While we are here, let us determine, let us make a decision to do all we can, not for ourselves, for Him, for His glory. Let us pursue the Lord. Let us pursue His calling. Let us pursue the lost. Amen? How did they conquer? Verse 10 and 12 tells us. Getting His men defeated their enemies. They did everything that they said they would do. They captured the Midianite king. They persevered in the face of opposition and criticism. And they enjoyed great victory. 
They did not quit. They did not give up. They did not let up. Because they would not be stopped short of victory. They saw God move in great power. Why? Because God is a consuming fire. Amen? God is a consuming fire. And, I, and, I, and I'm blessed because I, I see what God is doing. And God is looking for a willing and able vessel. Those who refuse to quit and persist in following the Lord will for their lives will see Him use them in great ways. Great ways. And He promises us. We see it here in His Word. Galatians chapter 6 verse 9. The Bible says, And let us not grow weary while doing good. Why? For in due season we shall reap if we do not what? Lose heart. We shall reap. I believe one day if we continue to stay the course, God may bless us with a nice building. I believe that. Now, I, that's up to the Lord. But he says, if you're faithful with the least, then the greater is there. I believe that. I believe God is going to do things that is going to continue to blow our minds. If you hang in there. If you continue to hold on to the Lord. It's amazing. I was talking to just yesterday about how we were in our little office with, with just literally a handful of people. Four years ago, and when we came here, literally, we walked in here with about 70 people three years ago. And we've seen God triple, quadruple the amount of people coming here. God is good. And you know what the best part is? We get to see it. See, there are those that will never get to see it. 2 Corinthians 4, 8, 9. Chapter 4, verse 8 and 9. I love this verse because it, it, it says, We are hard-pressed on every side, yet we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not forsaken. We are struck down, but not what? Destroyed. Amen. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31, the Bible says, But those who wait on the Lord, you like that verse, huh? Yes, read it together. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength, they shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Amen. Those who persevere will enjoy the best of God's blessings. But those who quit will see God do nothing. Nada. Nothing. So how did they conclude? How did Gideon conclude well, we see Gideon came back with the Midianite kings. He came to Succoth. He took their 75 elders and he, he took them out. You reap what you sow. You rank out on God, you're going to be dealt with. He put them to death by dragging them through thorns and briars until they died. We see it in verse 15, 16. When he came to Penal, what did he do? He tore down their towers and he killed their elders. God is not mocked. That's why when I go to high school and I see these kids laughing and giggling, it's like, really? <laughs> do you know who you're messing with? Do you know who you're mocking? <laughs> Be very careful. Be very careful. and You need to think about what you're doing right now. And then we see here that Gideon, that Gideon slew the Midianite king in verse 18 to 21. In other words, because he was obedient to the Lord and his will for his life. And Gideon enjoyed absolute victory over all the enemies. In the end, Gideon had the last what? Laugh. And, you know, when God tells you to do something, you do it. You do it. You don't compromise. You do it. And the principle is this. Those who walk with the Lord and do His will, guess what? You will also enjoy victory in your lives. It's that simple. If you want the Lord's blessing, His power and His victory to be manifested in your life, the only path you should follow is His path. Narrow is the way that leads to life. And broad is the way that leads to destruction. Why? Because it's easy to do that. It's easy to do what everybody else is doing. 
But it's, it may not be so easy to stay pure. It may not be so easy to not use vulgar language. It may not be so easy to, to go out with the guys or to do this or to do those things. It takes discipline to plan your schedule and to say, I'm going to be at church Wednesday. I'm going to be at church Sunday. I'm going to go to men's Bible study. I'm going to you know, organize my, my life through. It takes discipline. It takes all those things. And yet many of us, we, 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 we do it for our work. We'll do it for the Boys and Girls Scouts. We'll do it for the baseball teams. We'll do it for the football team. But when it comes to God, ah, His grace is sufficient. When you walk against Him, you can expect nothing but defeat. In conclusion, if you had to sum up your life today, how would you do that? How would you do that? Would you say that you are walking in pride? You one of those types? Would you say everything in your life is about political advantage? And you one of those types? Or can you honestly say that you are doing your best to be persistent in your walk with the Lord? All that you can. All that you can do. See, God is looking for people in this day that will take their stand for him and say we will not back down we will not back down and I'll tell you and you want to see good examples look at your kids man look at these kids in high school these kids these Christian club leaders that God is developing right now before our very own eyes in our church these kids are out evangelizing at their school these kids are out taking the gospel these kids are standing for righteousness Taking back our schools for the Lord. And he is looking for those who will get involved in his work. And help those who are trying to serve him. Not get in the way. Not being a distraction. And are you though, or one of those types? If the Lord has spoken to you about your heart. Your life and your service. The place to talk to him about that is right here. Right now. Come to Him. Recommit your life to His will. Ask Him to give you what you need. Surrender yourself to all that He wants you to be and do and get busy for His glory. Amen? Amen. Because if we expect God to do great things, then we need to be available for Him. God won't give us any more than we can handle. There's a good part of that and there's a bad part of that. Because I don't know about you, but I'm not content in God moving, in God saving souls. I want to see God do greater things. What about you? Some of you are like, I just made it to church on Wednesday. <laughs> man, I, man, Pastor, you can take it to war right now. Yes. Why? Because there is a war going on right now. People are dying and going to hell right now. Right now. When we go into high schools, there's thousands of kids that don't know Jesus. And God is doing that. We went to A.B. Miller, right? We went to three different classrooms. On the way out, guess where we went? We stopped at the ALC building. Where, you know who ALC, ALC is? All the troubled kids. There were all the kids that were basically locked up for the day. They were you know, in the line getting their lunch after everybody else. And they went back to their classroom. I'm like, who are those people? Those are the, the ones that are in trouble. I said, can I talk to them? The, the policeman said, yes, you can. Here's your classroom. The teacher said, come whenever you want. So on the way out, I said, Steve, and we're pressed for time. I said, listen, we're going to stop at ALC. I spent some time in ALC on Tuesday with these kids. And you walk in, they all have their head on their desk, all look depressed, no hope, no life. And I got to get up there and I got to preach the gospel to these kids in ALC. Amen. And some of those kids received the Lord in ALC. God took them to ALC and received the Lord. It was a blessing. And God just showed me, get out of my way. Get out of my way. Because I'm consuming fire. You're either for me or you're against me. So help you, God, if you're against me. You mean like the book of Acts? when you had those that were out there doing things of the Lord, and yet you had these religious leaders trying to come against them, and Gamaliel said, listen, 
Let's lead, let them do their thing because God forbid that they are from God and they were coming against the work of God. Last thing we want to do is come against God's work. Be fighting against God, our own team. So we're going to pray right now and I would just encourage you in, in, in your watch, in your life with God, I believe God's going to open the door for us and we're going to need all hands on deck. We're going to need all hands on deck. It's going to be a pivotal time for us as a church. I believe God is going to open a door and we're going to take that next step. And in that next step, guess what? The harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few. It breaks my heart when we have meetings and I ask our children ministry coordinators, how are you doing? And they say, we're doing great. We're exhausted, but we're persevering. But you know what? We, we don't have that much help. And I say, well, I know we have a church of about 400 people. What do you mean you don't have that much help? We just don't have that much help. Why? Why should that be a problem? It should never be a problem. The way I was always taught, if, I had a, if, if my kids were in children's ministry, then I better be serving in children's ministry. That was just, there was no question to ask. That's just the way I was raised in the church. In our, in our ministry, we were at our church for maybe about six months. And by that time, okay, you signed up, you're ready to go, you should be serving, giving back to what God's given to you. Amen? We should never have a problem in, in children's ministry because people are in there giving so other families can sit, and so as they're in there serving, then they can sit, and vice versa. Amen? And me and my wife started in the children's ministry. We served there for years, and it was cool. And we served together as husband and wife. And you know what it did? It brought us together. And I would give devotions. And that's where I started learning to teach the Bible. To little kids like, like, like these little ones right here. And they're, if you can teach them, you may be a preacher. <laughs> Amen? Seriously, if you can keep their attention, man, you can definitely preach. And so I would encourage you guys, really, be in prayer. Because if we can't get any help, God's not going to bless us. Why? Because our church is not a, it's a lazy church. God just doesn't fit in God's vocabulary. There's no such thing as a lazy Christian. And so I want to encourage you with that. Tonight as we, as we close and I'm going to pray that you, between you and God, you make that commitment. You know, God's going to speak to you and you know what he's saying to you and then that you respond to his calling. That's only going to tell it as we move forward what decision you made. It's between you and God. Not us. Between you and God. Father, we come before you, Lord. And we thank you for enlisting us in your arm. We thank you for saving us from ourselves, saving us from our sin, saving us from eternal damnation, Lord. And in that, part of being thankful, Lord, is just expressing it through our lives, Lord. By, Lord, just merely saying, here I am, Lord, use me. And, Lord, looking for opportunities, Lord, to get involved, to get involved, to get in the game. Actually, not even a game, Lord, to get in the warfare. You know, so, Lord, even as we looked at Gideon's life tonight, we saw those three types of people, Lord. We saw the prideful type, we saw the political type, and we saw the persistent type. And Lord, I believe that you want us to be persistent. And Lord, we are going to be tired. We are going to be exhausted. But Lord, even as you were on that cross, Lord, you, were, you, you had a dry mouth, you had a cotton mouth. And even as they took that, that sponge to your mouth, you refused it, Lord. And you were exhausted as you were beaten and you were whipped and you were, had thorns put on your head. Lord, and you, you had nails thrusted through your wrists and your legs and you could not breathe. And you were out there on that cross, exhausted by the sun zapping the, your energy. And yet, Lord, you did not quit. You gave up your spirit to God, but you did not give up on us. And so, Lord, I, I, I pray in the name of Jesus. As you see our hearts, Lord, you know we love you. And Father, but some of us, we just have some, some bad habits. Some of us, we just, we, we just need a touch from Jesus. We just need that supernatural strength. Lord, we need you to be real. We need you to show up. We need you to empower us. Lord, we need you to show us that we can do great things. So some of us lack faith. Some of us lack courage. Some of us rather just take a playoff. But Lord, today is the day, Lord. We're only here for a short period of time. Tomorrow we could be looking in your eyes for all eternity. And you're going to hold us accountable. You're going to say, what did you do with my son? What did you do with the, with the gifts that I've given you? 
What did, did you make excuses? Because he ain't going to accept excuses. He's going to have videotapes of every decision we make. And so I would pray even now with our heads closed and our eyes bowed that you would just take this time with, with the Lord as we sing this praise song. And if you need to make that commitment, if you need help, if you're struggling, that you would ask God to meet you. That we would not be people that criticize the work of God, but we would be people to come alongside the work of God. Together, even as Nehemiah built the wall, that we would just simply do our part. That's all, that's all God asks us to do. Just do our part. Just do our part. In the name of Jesus we pray. All God's children said. So we're going to sing this song, and if you need to make that recommitment with God, or you need to ask Him, cry out to God, then you do that. And then we'll close our service tonight. There's nothing worth more than will ever come close. Nothing can compare your heart